It's what happened, man. Be about it if you want to be about it, man. I'm here for whatever. Miss your pants already! <laughs> What's that, ass, nigga? Cucks with mask on, acting like they non-lethal. But at the protest, they fuck with all people. See your name categorize them as all peaceful. But in the streets they ride and they do an act of evil. Who would have thought a little frog could trigger this squad? I got the keg standing, standing up and saying praise God. That's me, magic, get them erratic. They got they all black on, plus they swearing that they are on. I sip the tears from an SJW. Look at the world throughout the years and what it's coming to. A bunch of betas with their crews trying to govern you. They love it too. Shit, it is doing what they'd rather do. George Soros, Harry Reid, and some other dudes. Pulling the strings and they watching where their puppets move. We've had enough of you. The hanging of these two rich billionaires and city squares coming soon. What you gonna do when you be out of eye with patriots with red hats on? Yeah, we love it now you hanging in. That's why my nines cock. Make your time stop. Turn you chickens into livestock. They hit us with a bike lock. Mm. Middle finger to Antifa. Bunch of goofy white boys smoking on their reefer. Never had no skills in life to be a leader. They want to beat us, so send their soul through the ether. Mm. Middle finger to Antifa. Bunch of goofy white boys smoking on their reefer. Never had no skills in life to be a leader. They want to beat us, so send their soul through the ether. Mm. A bunch of bitches at the protest with no test. Male feminists having no sex. I got the flag tatted on my own flesh. You try to burn that, it'll be your own death. I terminate and scan your whole set. See, you pose no threat. Most of y'all need a bow flesh. The skinny mob get a different job. Yeah, I'll be that guinea wob. That'll beat you down like the city cops. You motherfuckers fruity like some dipping dots. And I got the comic killers loaded to the tippy top. What up, Pete? You already know I'm in the zone now. Miss Jenny, your bitch, use the wrong pronoun. Where's Bernie Hans? Almost like a ghost now. It's like you know he's out there, but he can't be found. I bet he's in the high rise, coked out, sniffing a pound with his robe on, eyes rolling, limping around. Hey, yo, I cuck on sight, watch Tucker at night. And I only roll with bulls out of nut of your wife. And you the type to raise another man's kid, but that's your life. And I do it for free space and try to take a ride. Uh. Middle finger to Antifa Bunch of goofy white boys smoking on their reefer Never had the skills in life to be a leader They want to beat us, so send their soul through the ether hmm. Middle finger to Antifa Bunch of goofy white boys smoking on their reefer Never had the skills in life to be a leader They want to beat us, so send their soul through the ether is plagued by the specter of fascist violence and in an ironic twist these fascists call themselves anti-fascist antifa whenever conservatives want to speak on campus or hold a rally antifa groups are a reliable presence and they routinely try to stamp out speech using vigilante violence which they perversely justify as a form of self-defense like isaacs and his professor at john jay college of criminal justice he founded the antifa group smash racism dc and he joins us tonight Professor, thanks for coming on. Hi, how you doing? Thank you for having me. So your position, tell me if I'm mischaracterizing this, is f people you define as fascists do not have free speech rights. No. Uh, my position is that communities have the right to defend themselves against uh, groups that actively seek uh, to eliminate members of that community. D defend themselves against violence or defend yes, themselves against, against... against violence? I mean, we were talking about... Uh, no, but, no, but physical violence? So yes, if I say, violence. for example... We're talking about a history, uh, a group that has a history of... No, no, not, uh, not, not hate his... crimes. Yeah, no, we're not... No, no, are we going to pretend like we're just... We're, we're suddenly uh, in this ahistorical world uh, where, where oh, not, uh, Dylan I'm... Roof or Wade Michael Page doesn't exist, where uh, Anders Ravik doesn't exist. Are you kidding me? No. Are you only a professor, by the way? What? Uh, so here's here's the question, though. Is it past statements that have espoused violence, or is it acts of violence? It's so both. could you could you? It's okay, both. but we're talking could about. Could you talking... hold on? Let me just finish my question. Could could you 
commit violence against me if you thought that I had a history of saying things that you imagined were violent. I, I would never commit violence against you. Um, I actually, when I was younger, I was a libertarian, and I actually looked up to you when you were a libertarian. Okay, but let, let, um, let's take me out of this. Okay. Let, let's just, I, I want to know, like, the, the, the concept of self-defense is a legal concept, but it's mm -hmm. also got, like, a long sure. uh, history and tradition in common law. So... The idea is if I'm hitting you, if I strike you physically, if I physically commit violence against you, you have a right to commit violence back in order to protect yourself or your property. Sure. But you're seeming to say that anybody who has espoused ideas that have at some point in history led to violence can be the subject of violence from you. You're not saying that. No, I'm not saying that. Uh, what I'm saying is that I believe it is the right for communities to get together to assess what is a threat to them uh, and to defend themselves against that threat. So give me an example. Like, what public figure in America right now could be shut down, could have his free speech rights taken away, and could be the subject of violence under the standards you're describing? Uh, well, I mean, for instance, I, I, I think that the framework here of, of talking about violence as opposed to talking about preserving the very freedoms that you and I both enjoy uh, is, is a false one. I mean, ultimately, we're talking about a movement that actively advocates against all the fetters of democracy. Uh, I mean, we're talking about Richard Spencer, who uh, publishes an altright.com, publishes an article uh, on July 28th by a man named Vincent Law, uh, where the headline was, to protect free speech, get rid of democracy. Um, so I, we really okay, well, have to... I, you know what? I, okay, so let's let's use that example. I disagree with that. I haven't seen the piece, but it doesn't sound like something I'd agree with. It's, it's not. Does Richard Spencer have a right? to speak in public. Richard Spencer is a danger to society. When he speaks in public, what he is doing, he is publicly recruiting people to his very violent movement, very violent okay, ideology. So does, 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 does he have a right to speak in public? I don't think he has a right to speak in public unopposed, and that is ultimately what the purpose of Antifa is, is to show well, up and, and oppose him. But it's not opposition. You shut people down, you prevent them from speaking, and you commit violence against it's them. I know a number of people, well, don't tell me it's untrue, I know people who have been knocked down and beaten by people from Antifa. So that is true. It does happen. We have it on tape. We just roll the tape. Right. So you're saying, is that justified? Yes. I believe that communities have the right to defend themselves against threats to them, to their community. Against ideas they don't like. No, they against, have a right against, to commit against violence. people who have explicitly said that they want to eliminate those people from our society. But believe... you're conflating, you're conflating violence with ideas. No, if I have I'm not. not raised my hand to strike you, you have no right to right, strike but you me. Have to, but in order to raise your hand to strike me, you have to think that you're going to strike me. And when you when you are going out in public uh, as a protester, explicitly saying that you want to eliminate most of the people from this country, I believe most of the people in this country have the right to say no that's not okay okay but it's you absolutely have a right to say it's not okay what you don't have a right is to prevent me from saying what i think even if you disagree and you definitely don't have a right to commit violence against me and you're blurring the lines there and by the way don't you work at a criminal yes, <laughs> I mean, a college? Yeah. <laughs> it's hilarious. okay um you don't have the right to do that you have the right to make a counter case do you see the distinction so, 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 that i'm making so, 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 uh, tucker when i when i walked into this building um, I walked, I counted five security guards at the front door uh, and two police cars outside. Um, are you going to tell me that the violence that they would enact against someone who is looking to do you or any number of the people that work here harm, are you going to tell me that the violence uh, that they enact uh, to protect preemptively uh, the staff uh, that are protected also by uh, the barricades that you have? Uh, I don't even know what you're talking about. Honestly, I'm not, honestly not following are you. you. Are you protecting okay, because you I'm not pretend that you don't have security? Here. That, well, I actually don't have security, but there is security at there's security our building, in your building for sure. And, there's and the security reason that there is security, lots of buildings and the reason that there is security to prevent in people from getting is, violence. No, the reason that you you have security is because ultimately that security provides a space for nonviolent civil discourse, which is ultimately but you what we don't want. Oh no, so slow down. There are lots of million distinctions here, but you don't own the public square. You no, don't I own the, the street. But I believe the public and, owns the public square. And at the end of the day, you're not in Richard's, charge of the public, and you're not the public in charge isn't of even deciding. charge of public. Okay. We, we, are, we are talking uh, about a system that has been gerrymandering people out of public rep right. representation. Okay, if we're relying on the cops, ultimately those cops are working for the very people that you work for, uh, and not in the interest of the vast majority of society. We Do don't you, have representation. We by don't have you. representation by the state. We don't. Okay, like, this last, is something question, last question. Do you teach students? I do. 
Huh. And do you teach them that the First Amendment does not apply to people they disagree with? I teach them to think critically, and that's why I'm very open about my anti-fascism and my anarchism. So, uh, if someone in so if someone in your class said, you know what, I'm a Trump, I'm a Trump voter, I'm I've against affirmative action. I've had those, and I've, I encourage them to research and explore and hold them to the exact same standards that I hold any other student. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I do. I had an alt-right supporter actually in my class last semester. Yeah. I, worked, I, I worked with him on his papers. He started off kind of bad at citation. I got him better at citation, and he wrote a paper that was uh, an AP, AP paper. Um, yeah. I mean, I am right. not discriminating against my students. Yeah. Ultimately, Except you think that people you disagree should be beaten up, but whatever. All right, Congressman. I mean, Congressman. <laughs> Close, Professor. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Totalitarianism and atheism in the world today. This is a godless totalitarian regime in the same way that the Soviet Union was. Where is Pope Francis standing up against today's totalitarianism and today's godlessness, the march of which continues on in the over-secularization of Western society? Putin's, uh, his Rasputin is Alexander Dugan, and he constantly talks about this phrase strategic neutralization. He wants Americans to be full of discord, anger, division, and chaos. That's what the Russian interference operations are all about in the United States. This division, this insurrectionist revolutionary arm of American politics that Antifa represents, it serves the interests of Russia and China. This is Ivan Belostenko for Against Tide TV, each for Prong from Lublin, Poland. Uh, thank you for joining us again. We have a very special guest with us, uh, Jack Posobik from uh, One American uh, News Network. Hello, Jack. Thank you for being with us. Hi, Ivan. Thanks so much for having me on today. I really appreciate it. Same here. Thank you for joining us and taking this time to, to have a chat. You are the, um, the current correspondent for uh, One American uh, News Network. Uh, but also in 2016, you've been uh, the special projects director for Citizens for Trump, one of the biggest uh, grassroots movement uh, for Trump in the previous elections. And you're also a veteran officer in the Navy uh, intelligence, have been there for seven years. The author of uh, two books, uh, For the Warfare, a Doctrine for a New Generation of Politics, and also the recent one, uh, Citizens for Trump, the inside story uh, of the people's movement to take back America. So thank you once again for being with us and for taking time to speak with us. No, no, I'm, I'm always happy to come on as a, uh, you know, as an American with Polish heritage, you know, I'm always happy to come on to shows in Poland to, uh, to remember, you know, where I came from, what my heritage is. I've, I've always been proud of that Polish heritage. It's a shame we can have you here in studio, or at least in some form of uh, live interaction due to this uh, Chinese uh, CCP virus pandemic. Uh, but hopefully... Yeah, well, thanks to the CCP, they're they're cutting us all apart. But you know, hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully we'll beat the CCP, we'll beat their virus, and I'll be able to come over back back to Poland very soon. But... Um, so let me let me first uh, start with a topic uh, that recently, um, you know, in everybody's minds, the recent elections in Poland, uh, President Duda have won them. Uh, but I want to focus uh, back uh, to the Polish diaspora in the States. Uh, do you think uh, following President Trump uh, help to President Duda um, winning the elections in Poland, the polls in uh, in in United States would uh, help President Trump win the 2020 election? Well, I think there's definitely an area of the Polish diaspora where they see the connection, the strong relationship between President Duda and President Trump. That's definitely something that they view as not even political, but it's something where it's a strategic geopolitical alliance between this is international relations. Right. And this is creating a new international norm where the United States and Poland enjoy a strong relationship now. Uh, obviously, that had been in the norm in the past, but it was not the norm under Barack Obama, who turned America really away from Poland in, term, in terms of European policy and turned more towards uh, Ukraine in some senses, but also to Germany and Angela Merkel. And so with, with Trump going back to Poland, looking at the uh, renouncing the transfer of military troops, army troops from Germany, they're going to Poland. We're seeing the agreements like the Three Seas Initiative, and we're also seeing the increase of economic 
relationship uh, in regards to LNG and the sales of, between the U.S. and Poland and throughout Central and Eastern Europe. This is going to be in a massive boom for, uh, for the Polish people, for Eastern Europe, for Central Europe, and they understand that President Trump is a huge part of that. He's actually spearheading this, sending his Secretary of State over Mike Pompeo, pledging $1 billion to the Three Seas Initiative. And so I think for Poles and the diaspora here in the United States, if they are concerned with this, they're looking at that relationship, they're seeing how strong America has stood with Poland. They're seeing, of course, they remember that incredible speech that President Trump gave in Warsaw uh, right in 2017 at the beginning of his presidency. That wasn't a political speech. It wasn't left or right. It was a speech in defense of our heritage, in defense of our civilization, and in defense of our shared goals, the goals of liberty, the goals of freedom, and the goals of free practice of religion. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned the, uh, the switch from Germany more towards uh, Poland and the three C initiatives. Uh, I want to ask you about Russia. Um, switching topics here slightly. Um, Russia, uh, from what we can see, clearly interfered in the U.S. elections, and I don't mean uh, in the way your um, you know your um, mainstream media portrays it with Trump and and the, the Russia Gate, uh, but more of interference to to well you know go ahead and talk about that. And can you tell us? How do you think Russia interfered in your elections, and why did they do it? Well, Russia's goal for the United States is strategic and he constantly talks about this phrase, strategic neutralization. He wants Americans to be full of discord, anger, division, and chaos. That's what the Russian interference operations are all about in the United States. And so every time you see this division in the U.S., and we are divided right now, we see this friction, this plays into their hands. So it plays into what they want. It plays into their goals. Because if the U.S. is not working on the world stage, then Russia is able to, to come in and fill that power vacuum. Uh, and China is also allowed to come in and fill that power vacuum. So it plays into their interests as we see Russia moving to become more of a belligerent regional power. And then we also see China attempting to usurp the global order and to replace it and remake it in their own model. And so when you see things like the Three Seas Initiative, that, of course, becomes a bulwark, not just to the economic influence of China, but also to the economic and energy influence of Russia. Remember, of course, it's Russian gas prices and gas diplomacy and influence that they held over Central and Eastern Europe for such a long time. And it's been the United States under Donald Trump that's actually undercutting this. And by the way, this is actually something that started before Trump. It predated Trump uh, coming into office, the rise of LNG, which comes from fracking and shale in the United States. So it's been something that had actually predated him. But when he got into office, he greenlighted it, spearheaded it, and accelerated this program because he understood the strategic, both military, political, and economic relationship that the United States could have with Central and Eastern Europe. Um, that's, that's quite interesting. Um, in, you know, in our media and, and the commentators here, they often tell the sort of one-side story of uh, Trump being friendly to Putin, Russia. Um, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on this? Is he, is he friendly, or, or what, what's what's behind this this friendliness and this trying to? Well, I do think that the president has has looked at. Russia, and he's talked about bringing Russia back from the, uh, the, they were excised from the G7, they want to bring it back into the G8. This is similar to Reagan's policy of sitting down and rapprochement with, uh, with Gorbachev in the 1980s. They had the Reykjavik summit in Iceland, they had multiple summits. Uh, I think he understands that as a businessman, he's coming to it from the perspective of, you're not going to change Russia, you're not going to remove Russia, so you might as well talk to them. Uh, you saw him do this with Kim Jong-un and the North Koreans. That doesn't necessarily mean that you trust them or that you're making an alliance with them, but that you understand that you have your vested interests and they have their vested interests. So you, it's in everyone's good interest in terms of world peace and in terms of security that you're having that kind of, uh, that kind of open dialogue and open communication. Communication does not mean capitulation. It doesn't mean friendliness. It means you are working together to potentially make a deal that's better for all parties, including your own special interests, that being the interests of the American people and the free world. Uh, I want to come back to um, to China uh, for a moment there, because you mentioned you sort of in, intermention uh, Russia and China. Um, can you tell us about the current relationship of, of America and, and China now? 
following this this pandemic? Has it damaged the relationship? Is there a way of coming back to the previous uh, more good or bad, uh, more to speak, relationship, or is it damaged for good? Yes, the Chinese coronavirus has brought U.S. and China relations to their lowest point in 20 years. This is the type of relations that we saw between the U.S. and China from the 1990s on. Uh, this is probably, it's not quite on the level of Tiananmen Square, certainly, but it's, uh, it's got people reminded of the fact that this is the same Chinese regime that perpetuated the Tiananmen Square massacre, the same Chinese regime that took back Hong Kong and then took away their freedoms, the same Chinese regime that perpetuated the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, some of the great tragedies of communism, the great tragedies of the 20th century, that they have not reformed themselves. Yes, they've liberalized their economy in bringing in foreign direct investment and bringing in uh, American dollars and Western dollars. And of course, American companies have been all too happy to be compliant with that because of course, cheap labor and exploitation of the, uh, of the people in China can lead to greater profit margins for the United States. Also in terms uh, of what we've seen in medicine and pharmaceuticals, when so much of it is being made in China, not manufactured in the United States anymore, that becomes a national security issue when you have a pandemic like was caused just recently and is still going on from the Chinese coronavirus. And so what we saw China do with their failed mask diplomacy, when we learned that the mask diplomacy was actually a cover for their buyback programs to try to sell us our own masks, the N95 masks that they stockpiled early on in this when they were giving bad information to the WHO and in some cases giving no information to the WHO covering up this outbreak from the start, arresting doctors. This is the same Chinese regime. And I really think that people are now looking behind the curtain. The mask is off in a sense, even though our masks are on in, a, in the pandemic. And they're starting to see China for who they really are. Xi Jinping, you couldn't, and he's someone that I, I actually had the opportunity to meet once when I was working in Shanghai years ago. Um, he is definitely someone who has attempted to form a cult of personality around him. But I do think that that cult of personality is backfiring because people realize that he is the one that is the head of this entire oligarchy there in the Chinese regime. And uh, let's focus back on the elections. Uh, what will happen in your, in your mind, uh, in your view, if uh, Sleepy Biden or perhaps some other Democratic uh, candidate uh, wins the 2020 race. Uh, what, what, what will this uh, do to American-Polish relationship? Will that they well, the get idea better or worse? Is you've, got, you've got two competing views of international relations that are coming forward. You have real politic of Donald Trump and the American First Movement, or you have the, the liberal institutional version of, of international politics of Joe Biden, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, John Kerry, George W. Bush. Colin Powell. The, that is the type of international system that they want to go back to. So you're going to see if Joe Biden does become president or someone from his camp uh, replaces him and becomes president, which is a, you know, a strong rumor that's been out there, you are going to see a reversion of American geopolitical um, efforts. You're going to see a turn from Warsaw to Berlin. You're going to see those uh, the EU relationship with the United States become stronger. You're going to see the United States Will it be willing to um, be subservient to the United Nations, to not stand up for itself, and to really lower itself down? Remember, uh, in the Barack Obama administration, that's when I was an intelligence officer, that's what I was in, we constantly heard these refrains of America's, you know, America's managed decline, or uh, America is the fallen superpower, America is, is, is an empire in decline. These were the refrains of the Barack Obama to form of foreign policy, and that is what we would go back to in Joe Biden or really any other candidate from uh, from his team that would become president. How would that re reflect on the relationship of uh, U.S. with China if Biden or any other Democrat win? Yes, it would be returned back to the status quo. Remember, Biden, under the Obama administration, was in charge of the China account, as it were. He was also in charge of the, the Ukraine account, and so he, it was his goal to go over to China, and he, as he did multiple times, appearing with Xi Jinping. And at one point, he said, the rise of China is good for America. The rise of China will be good for American workers and the American, American economy. Of course, we've seen the effects of that, and we've seen the truth of, and the consequences of those policies. 
Joe Biden has never repudiated those statements. He's never looked back on or reflected on his own record of 40 years in the United States government. He's been a senator for a very long time, since the 1980s. Uh, he then became the vice president. He was the head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, a very powerful seat in that committee. So Joe Biden is responsible for America allowing and financing the rise of China for the entire time. That's the type of policy that Joe Biden would turn back to. Uh, what uh, Solomon Yu uh, has turned uh, um, Beijing intercourse uh, Joe, uh, saying that we need more, more intercourse with China. Uh, oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tell me, Jack, um, I wanted to ask you as well about um, the, the fact that, uh, I don't know if you guys have heard about this, um, the Polish government actually still haven't uh, categorically excluded Huawei uh, or other CCP suppliers from the 5G uh, network infrastructure building. Um, I know the messages are not um, getting through as clearly as they should. Uh, there's many declarations. The Vice President Pence was here and they signed a declaration of um, you know, ethical suppliers, but but still we haven't heard from the Polish government a clear declaration that Huawei or other similar suppliers are not are not going to be included in the 5G uh, tenders. Uh, what do you think will happen with the Polish-American relationship if somehow Huawei or similar vendor would be allowed to build the 5G network here in Poland? Well, I would encourage uh, anyone who's looking at Huawei uh, for their intercommunications and telecommunications services for 5G or any other service to understand that Huawei is indelibly tied to the PLA, the People's Liberation Army. This is the Red Army of China under a new name that they've had uh, since the founding of the People's Republic. This is an agency that is directly tied with Chinese military services, Chinese national security services, and Chinese intelligence services. So their ability to tra not only just track your phones and steal your data, but to also intercept your communications, the communications of your families and the communications of government officials, business officials, commercial secrets, espionage secrets. This will all be open for the Chinese. This is essentially like saying, do you want the KGB to set up your telephone network? That's what you're saying when you're asking Huawei to set up your 5G. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, we hope this clear message will get uh, to the government and other people who influence these decisions. I want to come back to uh, Russia and China, uh, you sort of interlink between them, and ask you about the BLM and Antifa protests. Uh, you took part in, in some of them as well as uh, you know, a reporter and being attacked. Um, do you think these, uh, these protests, uh, this Black Lives Matter and Antifa protests, are uh, spontaneous, or do you think they might be sponsored by the likes of Russia and China? Well, you mentioned uh, when I was attacked recently by Antifa at, at a protest where I was I was uh, standing up in defense of the statue of Abraham Lincoln, President Lincoln, one of our greatest presidents. And I really want to say thank you to all of my Polish supporters out there that came forward and stood with me in that event. There was a hashtag, uh, Talk Jack, and it went viral throughout all of Poland. And when that took place, I did a, a number of interviews at the time. And I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart that you know here I am, someone um, on the other side of the world, but so many people and Polish patriots stood up for me in that time. And I really want to say thank you so much because it was a trying time for us. Uh, when you come under attack, for standing up for what's right. When you come under attack for doing your job, my job as, as a reporter is protected by the First Amendment here in the United States, and criminals and domestic terrorists attempt to interfere and sow that chaos and division, uh, it, we need to stand up against this, regardless of what your politics are, regardless of what you think of uh, Donald Trump or Joe Biden, this is something that should go beyond that. It really is. And so I just wanted to say thank you, express my gratitude, and say God bless to everyone who supported me there. And as far as foreign interference, um, I did spend three days out in Chaz of Seattle. I did spend time at the Antifa protests and Antifa events uh, here in Washington, D.C. And while we, we cannot definitively say that there is foreign interference in these, I would go back to what I said at the beginning of this interview. This division, this insurrectionist revolutionary arm of, uh, of American politics this, that Antifa represents, it serves the interests of Russia and China, because as they seek to weaken America on the world stage, Antifa seeks to usurp 
and revolt against America here in our own domestic backyard. That is the threat that they pose. That is their goal. They don't support Republicans. They don't support Democrats. They support anarchy and violent revolution. That is who they are. And so those that would benefit from that do include America's foreign adversaries. Uh, and of course, the founding members of BLM themselves confirmed that they are trained Marxists. Uh, so. <laughs> yes, you can actually go, and I've, I've gone and, and looked at, at their, um, their blog, their website, and you can find not only support for raising funds for abortion, but also a glowing eulogy that the BLM organization put together for Fidel Castro, the communist dictator of Cuba, when he died in 2016. And so you have to understand that this organization stands for something that I think is radically different than the simple police reforms that most people think it, uh, it does. Um, let's uh, jump back to Europe and, and to Vatican. Uh, Huawei is sponsoring a conference uh, in the Vatican uh, under the One Nation, One Planet uh, initiative uh, about global influence in education. And we also had uh, Elmer Yuan, uh, recently a Hong Kong businessman, uh, on our television, uh, shared some light on the connection of Vatican and the CCP. Um, also, Greta Thunberg is going to be on that conference. Um, so, what what are your thoughts about uh, about this CCP influence uh, on the Vatican? You have been vocal on Twitter criticizing the Pope, and uh, at the same time, you also state uh, that you know you're a Catholic. Uh, how do you how do you combine those two things? Criticizing yes, the Vatican, well, the Catholic Church. Uh, and as, I, as a Catholic, I you know I've been Catholic my whole life. I I am a, a practicing Catholic. I, my son is baptized Catholic. We go to church uh, whenever we're allowed under this Chinese coronavirus pandemic. But I would urge the Vatican to be very careful about their connections with China. China is the leading force of totalitarianism and atheism in the, in, in the world today, in the entire world, is China. This is a godless totalitarian regime in the same way that the Soviet Union was. And it was Pope John Paul II that stood up to the Soviet Union towards the end, towards the 1970s, that gave birth to the Solidarity Movement. He came to Warsaw. He presided over mass in Warsaw. Where is Pope Francis, the current pope, standing up against today's totalitarianism and today's godlessness, the march of which continues on in the over-secularization of Western society? And so I would ask Pope Francis to please stand with the faith, the faith that's been under attack. We've had churches burned here in the United States. We have a Catholic saint statues torn down in, in, uh, in Turkey. They're reverting the Christian church, the Hagia Sophia, back into a mosque. This is something Erdogan is doing. And so I, I understand that Pope Francis did express his regret for this, but I would encourage him to stand up to these illiberal forces, to stand up to these atheist forces, because his role is that of the Pope, the leader of our faith. And I would encourage him to defend us when we're facing so many threats from outside. Uh, we uh, in our television have started a campaign to support uh, Donald Trump after the hate he received uh, visiting the St. John's, uh, uh, John's uh, Church uh, in uh, Washington, uh, holding up a Bible. Uh, so we invite our viewers to join that action as well and, and hashtag uh, Christians for USA uh, Christians oh, for Christians Trump for USA, I love it Yeah, so uh, please do if, if you want to uh, you can also join us uh, Jack in this uh, campaign and share it on Twitter uh, with your followers as well um, For um, to finish up I want to ask you a personal question about uh, one of your tweets and you, you quite often uh, tweet about uh, Jesus and your faith um, you've mentioned in one of your tweets um, something uh, I, can, I can quote um, admit that you're a sinner, that you need God's help be willing to change your mind and turn, to you, uh, turn from your sin believe that Jesus Christ died for you was buried, buried and rose from the dead ask Jesus into your heart and uh, to become your personal Lord and Savior can you just briefly expand on, on what you mean in those, in those few, few words well you know I mean in terms of that where I've been blessed in in this world to um, you know have a Twitter account and have a social media platform that's given me the ability to spread a lot of messages to the world. And it's given me a platform that I really didn't expect to have. Um, I, I initially signed up for Twitter just so I could uh, spend time while I was on deployment in the military, just you know something to do. And 
uh, talk about TV shows and movies. And now here I am with this incredible platform and so many wonderful followers. Um, I've been retweeted by the president a number of times, and I, I appreciate him for that. And so going back to my Catholic faith, going back to my roots, when I think about how I'd like to use this platform to do good in the world and how I would like to use this platform to spread anything that I can, you know, whether you call it digital evangelism or not, it's, you know, Christ tells us in the Bible to spread the good news. And so even though I'm more known for uh, commenting on politics or commenting on pop culture, I do try to do as much as I can to spread that good news to the world and hopefully just hopefully that the, that word will fall on fertile ground, on fertile soil, and that people will look to it and understand that even in this world that we live in that's full of nihilism, uh, postmodernism, or secularism, to understand that the faith is still there, that God is still there, that Christ is still there. And if you choose to accept him, if you choose to come back to the church, if you choose to come back to the faith, that you will always be welcomed with open arms. Jack Pasovic, thank you very much for, for being with us today and for sharing this amazing insight. Anything you want to share with our uh, Polish viewers before we finish up here? Oh, no, I just say that you know, stay strong, Poland. The United States stands with you. Um, you have stood against the forces of fascism, communism, and imperialism time and time again. Poland was partitioned, Poland was occupied, but Poland never failed. Poland never failed quit and Poland never surrendered and I say thank you to everyone in Poland today that continues to keep that spirit alive that has kept the Polish people alive for the entire history thank you thank you much Jack and we also uh, thank our um, American friends and Poland of course stands with US um, thank you very much for being with us and for sharing this information Thanks so much. Jake Posobik, uh, correspondent Thanks, and host for One American News Network. Thank you for being with us. My name is Ivan Belstenko. This is Against Night TV. Till next time, God bless. What is kind of interesting is that a lot of people have brought medical supplies, uh, and, and not just talking like the EMS crew, but also. Um, Oh, we got a we got a fire going on over here. There was a flag burned. Here, let me, let me turn the phone around real quick. So anyways, if you're just tuning in uh, outside the White House, <coughs> Antipo's here, Black Lives Matter's here, locals are here, out outer towners are here. Uh, so that was a CS. That's going to be, uh, oh, man. oh, gosh. So that was CS. That gas is no joke. Of all reasons to wear a mask, maybe it's that, right? So we got a fire there. I'm not sure what's burning. I'm not sure what's burning, but it's bad. There's a big explosion. There's been a few. There's been a few big explosions. A lot of times they turn out to be fireworks. Uh, other times there's the CS gas. It's pretty, uh, pretty bad. Here we go.
So we're outside the White House. And it's, um, we got Black Lives Matter out here. We have Antifa. We have. We got people saying phrases like that. an update so uh, DC is actually on a uh, 11 o'clock curfew I'm not sure how they're gonna enforce it a lot of the attention is gonna be here at the White House but um, I've been out of town for over a month and I just came in tonight and here I am at the White House now covering the protest so this is fun uh, I was hanging out with some friends and uh, we're playing skip while we'd eaten tacos and, and now we're uh, checking out this riding so We also have a lot of uh, police lined up. I'm not sure if you can see them from this angle. There's the White House back there. They're all lined up. It's kind of hard, it's kind of hard to do that. That smoke's getting black. Just for some perspective, just a few minutes ago, that fire was just one wooden wooden post, like a stop sign post. They since brought in a lot of um, <coughs> burnable barriers and other signs. That fire is getting really big now. It's pretty bad. We got people up in trees. Some trees, fires. I'm gonna take you over back back to the um, the police line by the White House. See if we can get any any good views there. Excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> I smell such a strong blend of CS gas and marijuana, but here we are, right? I'm not sure what building that is right there, but um, guys are firing off. I'm not sure what they were, but they were on fire bottles, um, little makeshift bombs. They were throwing them off the building here towards the police line. We'll take you there here in a second. Wheel, there's only me. I'll take you there. So if you see here, this is the, the building they were on. There's the police line over there. I'm not sure if you can see it. I just pointed at my screen as if you can see me pointing. <laughs> but uh, the police line's over there. There are a couple of uh, other loud, loud pops, and that was it. Everyone, everyone kind of rushed, but it looks like they're all back now. <laughs> this is pretty nuts. Oh, every time I hear glass at the ground, I get a little nervous, but.
haziness is the CES gas that they popped off earlier. Uh, it was a clear night, but here we are. If anyone's commenting, I can't really see what's who's commenting. I can't really respond, but it's good. Here we go. Looks like they're putting barriers back into place. what they're saying, but... <laughs> I'm gonna take it to the police line here. You can see it a little better. <laughs> there's still there's still gas in the air a little bit. There's another big fire here. I gotta go. I'm not sure if you can tell with the camera. Oh, shit. Let me turn it around. That's the police line there. Hey, fuck the pig who threw a flash painting at my head! You know who the fuck you are, motherfucker! <laughs> well, I'm glad I got destroyed the police line, but I don't feel like getting shot in the head by a by a, a gas bomb. That fire's getting big. American flags and other clothing just to fuel it. Uh, someone said something about the cops are making their way this way. I mean, there's cops everywhere, but the, uh, the police line. It'll be interesting to see what happens when the police line and the uh, the crowd clash. I've been driving for like eight hours today. I'm kind of tired, but I couldn't pass it up, so.
there has been some movement on the police line behind us. I can't really tell what they're doing. I thought there was going to be a big boom. I'm not sure what the cops uh, over by the White House are doing. There's been some movement. They've been uh, shifting their positions. They haven't seemed to be advancing towards us, though, so we'll see. I'm not trying to get too close to the fire because I'm seeing them throw a lot of glass bottles and things like that inside. I don't feel like uh, feeling the shrapnel. But. Y'all are going to have to forgive me if I get a little loopy. I have been secondhand smoking marijuana all night. This crowd is crazy. I just threw a tree in, uh, in that fire. It didn't look like a marijuana tree, but it sure smells like it. You gotta be kidding me. <clears throat> Shoot. They, the cops, they let that, there's a house on fire and they just, the cops are firing something rather in our direction. Not quite sure what they're firing, but those cops, uh, and you gotta see if you can, I'm not sure if you can tell, there's a house, okay. So they lit a house on fire, or some building, it wasn't the White House, but some big building across from it. It was the building that they were sitting on when they were launching fires off that I was telling you about, fire rockets towards the, uh, towards the cops. And, uh, Anyways, as soon as they lit that house on fire, that's when the officers on the police line started firing. Probably, I don't know, rubber bullets, beanbag bullets, I'm not sure what it was. I didn't get hit. But, welcome back to DC, right? Goodness gracious. There we go. We're good. Thank you. 
Well, that was fun. <clears throat> so we're all watching the fire, and there were a couple of pops. There's been pops all night, though. It's basically uh, CS gas, or it's uh, firecrackers, something along those lines. Well, they lit a house on fire. Yeah, we'll see if you can see it. Not that fire there, but there's a building. Uh, they probably put the fire out. But once that place went up, the officers on the police line, they started firing off um, some sort of projectile. There's another one. Hey, I appreciate y'all's concern, but if you would maybe not call me right now only because I'm trying not to lose the connection. And I'm, um, I'm live on my phone. Hold up. If you look behind, the police line is advanced all the way up to the front where the barriers are. Um, might still be hard to see from where you're at or from this angle. But here's the fire. This is the fire they started probably a half hour or so ago. And it's uh, it built up. They just, uh, everyone left here. They're throwing scooters in there. I'm going to get out of the way because I feel like I'm in the line of fire. There's the police line. They're, uh, can't turn the phone around. You can tell they're actually taking down a, a uh, looks like a stop sign, stoplight. What is that?